Why are we so quick to disqualify ourselves from his work in ways that if he used them would display his strength and his power even more clearly? Maybe you're not a deliverer of a country whose small step will inspire thousands of people to finally take their first step, like Ehud or Gandhi or Rosa Parks. But I'm not sure you're far enough along in your story to make that determination. And I'm not sure it's your responsibility to make that determination either. But I do know you'll never know without a step. Well, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and meet me in Judges chapter 3 today. Uh, We're going to be in Judges chapter 3. As you just heard, we're continuing. This is week 2 of a series that we've called Wax Museum Saviors. If you weren't here uh, last week, uh, the whole idea of a wax museum, uh, a wax museum at, at first glance, and especially from a distance, feels like this collection of some of the world's greatest leaders in their very finest moments. But you know if you've ever been to a wax museum, that's how it looks from a distance, at a glance, but as you move a little closer, you begin to realize that things are a little less than what meets the eye. In some ways, that's what the whole book of Judges is about. We look at these leaders and this collection of leaders, and at first glance from a distance, it appears to be some of Israel's greatest leaders in some of Israel's finest moments. Leaders like Samson and Gideon that we learn about as kids, and yet as we take a closer look And sometimes with grown-up eyes, we begin to realize that things are not always the way they seem. That their stories are a whole lot more complicated. Not unlike our stories, individually and sometimes collectively. And in fact, that's the point of the book of Judges. It's not just to hold up a leader, it's to hold up a mirror. And to show us something about the people that we follow the leaders that we choose, and the leaders that we tend to be all along the way. In some ways, all of these leaders that we look at are like caricatures of the people of Israel. Remember the caricatures that you would do like at Six Flags or at the mall sometimes where somebody would draw a picture of you and they would accentuate your most awkward characteristics and put them there for the world to see? Book of Judges shows us the kind of leaders that the Israelites looked for and looked to and the kind of people they aspired to be. And it draws them out. It makes them larger than life. And what it shows us in every single case is where their aspirations sometimes lead and where ours do as well. In fact, as we look at Exhibit A today in this Wax Museum of Saviors, uh, I feel like maybe the best way to start talking about leadership and the kind of leaders that we aspire to be and to follow uh, might just be to do a little leadership pop quiz with you. You guys up for a pop quiz today? Can you do this? All right, so uh, if you take notes on a phone or if you write uh, on a piece of paper, go ahead and have that out. Just jot down your answers. You're not going to share them with anybody else necessarily, but we are going to check our work. So I want you to stay tuned for this. Uh, The topic is world leaders from history. And uh, just a little pop quiz, okay? So don't say it out loud. Just write it on your paper. We'll check our work at the very end of it. Everybody together? We ready to go? Okay, six questions, and I just need a name as the answer for each of the six questions. First one is this. I need the name of the leader of Rome in the year 30 AD. The name of the leader of the Roman Empire in the year 30 AD. 
just the name, no Googling. Okay, that's question one. Question number two is this. I want the name of the ruler in England in the year 1900. If you know, maybe a little bit of a hint, it might trick you a little bit. Uh, the ruler of India was actually the ruler of England in the year 1900. The ruler of England, just a name. Again, no Googling, no wagering, no table talk. Just write it down and we'll check our work. Okay, last one, maybe easier for some of you who are the OGs in the room. Uh, you are alive at this time. 1955, the name of the ruler of the United States of America. In 1955, the name of the ruler of the United States of America. How's it going? We doing okay? You guys feeling fairly confident? I see some whispering. You're cheating. That's okay. I'm not going to call you out from up here. I know how this goes. Uh, so three more. Let's go. Okay, let's, let's just attribute some quotes. Okay, I need the name of the leader who said this. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The name of that leader, just the name. Okay. That's question number four. Number five, this leader used a strategy of nonviolence to lead India to its independence and is famous for saying, you must be the change you want to see in the world. First name or last name is all I need for that one. That's number five. Here's the last one. You ready? Hey, this person uh, is a woman. She told a bus driver, I don't think I should have to stand up. And when he told her that he'd have her arrested if she didn't, she said, you may do that. Just the name of that leader. Okay, pencils down. Let's check our work. How'd we do? Question number one uh, was the ruler of Rome in 30 AD. Who feels like they nailed it? Anybody feel like they nailed it? Somebody say Augustus. Anybody say Augustus. Yeah, so August, Augustus was actually only the emperor until 14 AD. I heard the right answer. Tiberius was actually the leader uh, in 30 AD. He reigned until 37 AD when his nephew Caligula took over. Uh, but it was Tiberius. Some people get Tiberius? Anybody? I heard it. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Way to go. Some world history buffs. Okay, second question. Uh, the leader over India actually was the leader of England. Anybody know who the ruler of the British Empire was in 1900, turn of the century? It was Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria was the ruler over England and India at that point. She actually died in 1901, so she was just barely hanging on at that point. Edward VII uh, became king right after her, so if you wrote down Edward, partial credit, but you're still wrong. So, uh, 1900, it was Queen Victoria. Uh, third question was this one. Some of you nailed this. 1955, United States. Who was the president of the United States in 1955? Eisenhower. Eisenhower was the president uh, from 1954 until 1961, the 34th president of the United States, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Some right answers there. All right, yeah, more hands. We're doing better. Okay, so uh, next question. Uh, uh, quotes. Who was it uh, that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. World leader's name was? Who got Jesus? Look at you guys. Wow, Okay. Question number five, be the change you want to see in the world. Who was that? Gandhi. Some people get Gandhi. Hands up. Go loud and proud if you got it right. Let's tell everybody. Okay. Question number six, because I saw you the first couple of questions. It didn't go so well. All right. Question number six, last one. Uh, I don't think I should have to stand up. Who was that leader? Rosa Parks. Some people get Rosa Parks. Loud and proud. We kind of turned it around there for those last three questions, didn't we? Went a little better. Okay, think about this. If you'd looked around Rome in the year 30 AD and you'd ask the question of everybody there, who's going to be the most remembered leader 2,000 years ago? When people tell our story, someone in 30 AD is going to say something or do something that when people look back at our era of history, they're going to say that person was the leader. Would you say the leader of Rome, Tiberius Caesar, or would you have said a homeless Jewish carpenter from a little town by a lake? And yet, 2,000 years later, when we tell the story, virtually all of us knew the quote, I'm the way, the truth, and the life from Jesus. None of us know anything that Tiberius Caesar said. 
When it came to the turn of the century, 1900, if any of us was to say somebody's going to lead the way in something, somebody's going to make some change in India for something, somebody's going to turn this thing around for the better in the world, somebody's going to do something this year that people will still be talking about 100 years later, who would we have picked would be the leader with influence who would change the world for the better? Would we have said the Queen of England? Or Gandhi? Gandhi who? In the year 1900. In the year 1955. If he'd stood there on January 1st and said, in December of this year, 1955, someone is going to say something and do something that 50 years later, people are going to still remember as having changed our world for the better. Who would you have guessed? The military statesman? The president of the United States? or a seamstress from a department store in Alabama. Maybe our hero pickers and our leadership predictors could use just a little bit of work. And you know, the book of Judges says that's not a new problem. And that is a problem because all of us follow leaders. In our country, we get to choose leaders. And every single one of us are leaders. Even if we don't really feel like we're the leader type. In fact, that's sort of what the quiz reveals, isn't it? I mean, some of the world's finest leaders didn't have any of the things that most of us would assume are a part of the leader type. They didn't have power, at least worldly speaking. They didn't have a position. They didn't have big followings. They didn't have official roles. They didn't come from powerful families. But when their stories are told, they marked the course of the world for change for the better. We're going to see the same thing today. We look at a story that holds up two leaders. One of the leaders has everything that the people of Israel felt like they needed and wish they had. And one of them is just about everything they're afraid they might become. One of them will deliver Israel by the end of the story, and one of them is going to find their leadership and their legacy in the toilet. Literally. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Writer says, again, that's an important word, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years, four and a half election cycles. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. Okay, let me point out a couple of things real quick, and we'll get back to the story. First, you recognize the cycle. If you were here last week, you know this is a cycle that's going to show up over and over and over in the story. The people of God rebel. You see rebellion. They rebel against God. And then there's resistance that comes into their path. And they respond to God, and they ask him for help, and he rescues them. And then they return towards the promise. And then they forget, and they rebel once again. That's the story of the book of Judges, and it's going to come up over and over and over. And it tends to be the story of our hearts, too. That's why it's so important for us to look at. And you're introduced in this story to two leaders. One of them is the king of Moab. It's a guy named Eglon. He's got the position. He's got the power over Israel. And you notice he's been the leader over Israel for 18 years when this story takes place. But then you see another leader. Verse 15, a deliverer, his name is Ehud, a left-handed Benjamite. Okay, a couple of details about that that make that 
description a little bit intriguing. Uh, First, it's true, until modern day history, uh, most of the world thought that being left-handed was a specific kind of disability. Really, even until the modern era, I had a a great-grandfather whose parents tied his left hand behind his back so that he would be forced to be right-handed through the course of his life. We know these days, of course, that there are great leaders, um, and even actually a disproportionate number of great leaders who are left-handed. Great leaders like Colin Powell, Barack Obama, George Bush, Tom McGoffin, left-handed. Some of the really great ones, you know? But it's even more specific than that in this passage. It doesn't just say that he was left-handed. Actually, the Hebrew here, rather than saying that he was left-handed and emphasizing what he could do, it actually emphasizes what he couldn't do. Instead of saying he was left-handed, it actually says he couldn't use his right hand. And most scholars believe that this guy, Ehud, was a person who had a physical, visible deformity or a disability that made him unable to use his right hand for anything. It wasn't just that he was left-hand dominant, it's that he couldn't use his right hand at all. And that's particularly ironic when it comes to him being described as a person who is a deliverer. Because all throughout the scriptures, right-handedness was a symbol of power and position. I will uphold you by my righty, mighty right hand. Sit here at my right hand while I make your enemies a footstool. And yet we have a leader here who can't use his right hand at all. Not only that, he's a Benjamite. And Benjamin, you know what the word Benjamin means? It means son of my right hand. This whole tribe was like the best and the brightest and the strongest and the most powerful in all of Israel. In fact, even today, the Israelite army, their rallying cry is, Behind you, O Benjamin. Benjamin, Benjamites, they were like the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, Air Force Parajumpers. They were the first ones in, they were the last ones out. They were the best and the brightest and the strongest. And here comes a deliverer who's a Benjamite who can't use his right hand. And as Israelite fathers told their Israelite children this story, the children would have laughed and said, there's no way this story ends well. Keep reading in the story. When it comes time to pick jobs, Ehud is the guy who gets asked to do the job that nobody else wants to do. He gets to carry the tribute of Israel to the king who has oppressed them in their own land for 18 years. Look at verse 15. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. Okay, let me pause. This is not body shaming. If you're easily offended, there will be a chance for you to be offended in just a moment. This is not it. Okay, they're not just drawing out his heft here. They're making a particular statement. It's hard for us to understand because in our world, things have gone in the opposite direction. We're like being skinny is a virtue. Being fit is a, a symbol of privilege and power because you can afford a trainer. You can afford the gym. You can afford exercise. You can afford food that's whole, that keeps you skinny. It's a symbol of privilege and power. In their day, it was the opposite. In a hand-to-mouth culture, to be overweight was a sign of blessing and privilege that the gods had favored you. And Eglon was a fat, fat man. So understand, in some ways, this king represents everything that the Israelites wanted for themselves, everything they expected from God for themselves. As they walked into this land that was promised by God, that was flowing with milk and honey, the land of blessing, and produce that took two people to carry. They expected to come into the land that God had promised, to experience God's presence, and to consume all of God's blessings for themselves, and to be totally unbothered by the world around them. And I wonder if you expect the same thing from your life with God today. Instead, this king, Eglon, is getting fat on their blessings. 
The fat king represents everything that Israel wanted and expected and felt entitled to from God for themselves. We can fall into the same mentality as the Israelites, can't we? Where our ideal from God is for him to put us in a position where we don't have to depend on him for anything. Where we can live life to the fullest without him. And God loves us too much to let us live there. In fact, that's what he told the Israelites at the very beginning of this chapter. He left some resistance to test their reliance. Not in the sense of testing them and putting a gotcha moment right in front of them, trying to catch them doing something bad. It's not that kind of a test. It's more the kind of test that a physical trainer or coach would put in your path. Somebody that allows some level of resistance around you Not to defeat you, but to develop you, to deliver you. God doesn't want the people of Israel, and he doesn't want you and me, to forget where our strength comes from. And he knows that without resistance, our reliance tends to get flabby. And you see it in Eglon. And I wonder if you see it in you. Two leaders. One is the picture of privilege and power, position, literally fat and happy and in control of everything. The other is broken, disfigured, weak, and outcast, who would have been picked last for everything. He certainly wouldn't have thought of himself as a leader. But keep reading. He's in perfect position. Verse 18, after Ehud has presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they left. You remember Gilgal from last week? That was the place on the promised land side of the Jordan River. God told the people to stack their rocks from the river that he'd led them across so that they'd always remember his power, his presence, his promise, and his purpose for them. And they promised, we won't forget. And then they walked away and forgot. Ehud gets to the stone images at Gilgal. Either the rock collection that the Israelites had stacked up there or more likely idols built to the Canaanite gods that were built with the rocks that the Israelites had stacked there. The implication is Ehud gets to that place and he remembers the promise, the presence of God, and he sees the rocks and he says, hang on a second. This can't stand. This can't be. And he goes back to the king and says, I've got a secret message for you from the Lord. And because of his weakness, he gets in to see the king in private. Look at the rest of the story, verse 20. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. He never would have expected it from the left hand. Even the handle, check this out, sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. You got that in your mind's eye? Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the open room behind him and locked them. After he'd gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. And they said, he must be playing Wordle and reading the newspaper (laughs) in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment. And come on, we know what that point is, don't we? Somebody comes over to your house, they excuse themselves for a moment, and they're gone, and they're gone, and they're gone, 
and you kind of feel like maybe you ought to go check on them, but nobody wants to go check on them. When he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their Lord fallen to the floor, dead, and they said, poop. Okay, I'm done. While they waited, Ehud got away, he passed by the stone images and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills and leading them, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong, not left-handed. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. Can we just agree if you were making up a religion out of thin air? There are about 12 different reasons you would never have included this story. It feels borderline irreverent. Some of you think, no, it's way over the line of irreverent. Not to mention violent and deceptive, right? And remember, the point of the Wax Museum saviors, it's not to say what Ehud did or how he did it was fully sanctioned by God. Although, the irreverence of the story does seem to be part of the point of the story. Story includes details, right? In a way that young Israelite fathers would tell their young Israelite son while their Israelite mothers rolled their eyes. Or maybe not. One of the ladies that helps me think through my sermon every single week said she was reading this young story to her young daughter the other day, and they both got to giggling so much the young daughter went to go tell her father, who rolled his eyes at the story. But the bigger lesson isn't just that. Bigger lessons lesson for people like us who are attempting to answer the question, who will I trust to lead my life? What kind of leader will I elevate? What kind of leader will I imitate? How will I use my influence? Particularly those of us who don't think of ourselves as leaders. Ehud is an early story that proclaims God can use anyone. God can use anyone. In fact, look at the person next to you and tell them, God can use you. Go ahead, say it out loud. God can use you. Now turn to the person on the other side, the person you didn't choose, and tell them, maybe especially you. God's never been limited by our limits. Your biggest adversity could be your greatest advantage. Isn't that what we see with Ehud? If it hadn't been for a visible, physical disability or deformity, he never would have been allowed in the room with the king alone. He never would have caught the king by surprise. He probably never would have been in position to be the one chosen to carry the tribute to be in the king's presence in the first place. If God's strength is made perfect in our weakness, why are we so quick to disqualify ourselves from his work in ways that if he used them, would display his strength and his power even more clearly? What did Ehud do? As he walked by Gilgal, He remembered, we've been weak and outnumbered and overpowered and outmanned and up against armies and oceans before. And we had to step out before we could walk across. But we stepped out and we saw God come through. And right then and there, Ehud decided to live as if God's promises were still true, regardless of his fears 
there's feelings of inadequacy, and whether or not anyone else followed. And that's all it took. This morning, I wonder if you've got a Gilgal. What's your Gilgal? Maybe it's an area like we talked about last week where you know he's promised and you're simply refusing to live as if his promise is true. Or maybe it's something in your world that you realize is not right and where you realize you're not right-handed. But you might be the right person in the right spot to do the right thing first. Maybe you're not a deliverer of a country whose small step will inspire thousands of people to finally take their first step, like Ehud, or Gandhi, or Rosa Parks. But I'm not sure you're far enough along in your story to make that determination. And I'm not sure it's your responsibility to make that determination either. But I do know you'll never know without a step. That's the second question. Where am I left-handed? Where am I left-handed? Not literally, figuratively. My guess is you've got a vulnerability and maybe a vulnerability story that God may want to leverage as a part of his victory story. You notice God didn't heal Ehud's right hand. He didn't take away the adversity He used the adversity as an advantage. And I wonder if he might want to do that through you. I think of a friend of of Carrie and mine who, after 20 years, thought his learning disabilities had wrecked him. And yet he learned that they'd formed him in a really unique way. At first, it felt like it limited all of his options. But today, he sees that it didn't just limit his options, it narrowed his focus, it sharpened his focus. And it pointed him to a career as a chef that he never would have discovered otherwise. And now he's noticed that being a great chef has put him in position to serve people with similar learning disabilities all the time and also to put them in a place to flourish. I think of my friends Mark and Chelsea. They saw statistics about the foster care system in the world and said, the church could solve that. We don't have what it takes to solve that. But we could do something. And they did something. And then some people followed and did something. And I bet you they're a part of what God's using to see a day where the church does solve the foster care system challenge. But the story's not really about them. It's about us. It's not about learning disabilities or foster care systems or hefty kings or lefty saviors. The question's about you. Where are you in position? Where do your vulnerabilities point? What step could you take today towards something that God's promised, whether or not anyone else follows? And here's the big point that the judges are going to keep pointing us to. You are never more like Jesus than when you live that way. Jesus is the perfect, ultimate, left-handed Savior. No beauty or majesty that would attract him, us to him. No earthly platform or human power. Despised, forsaken, rejected, betrayed, and nailed to the ultimate symbol of defeat. In the ultimate display of weakness and vulnerability, God was declaring his ultimate victory. When God went to his death for you and rose from the dead to invite you to life, wherever you go from here, wherever you're starting from today, the invitation is the same to you as it's been to all people of all time. The God of the promise and the one with the power says, trust me, just take a step. Would you bow your head with me? If this morning you've never put your trust in Christ, that's the first step. 
He came to the earth, died on a cross, rose from the dead to forgive your sins, to give you everlasting life that costs you nothing. It's a gift. He's paid for it, and he offers it to you, and he simply invites you not to be strong, not to be powerful, not to have a position, not to have privilege, simply to trust him who holds it all. And you can do that right where you sit today. Lord, for those who are trusting you for their very first step today, Lord, we are so grateful and want to celebrate with them. And Lord, for some of us who realize that we trusted you for eternal life a long time ago, but it's been a long time since we trusted you for life today. And we've organized our life and desired that you would lead our life in a way that we didn't have to lean on you at all. And today we realize, no, you've put us in perfect position for a step. And all of the adversity that we've faced up to this moment has put us in the perfect position for an advantage to take a step of trust in you and believing that your promises are true. Would you let us take that today, whatever that next step is, let us be people who walk with trust and courage and hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.